Though many children are now eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, families continue to have questions about how best to keep their children safe and healthy. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hitterly with AHA Communications. In this new series, Joining Hands to Build Pediatric COVID-19 Vaccine Confidence, we're speaking with leaders from three national organizations to discuss how to address vaccine hesitancy, specifically for kids in historically marginalized communities. Today's podcast is moderated by AHA's Priya Pathesia, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. She's joined by Rita Karian, Vice President for Health at Onitos U.S. They'll be discussing how to overcome barriers to vaccine confidence and access in Latino communities. This podcast was funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The contents of this resource do not necessarily represent the policy of CDC or HHS and should not be considered an endorsement by the federal government. And now, over to Priya. Hi, Rita. Thank you so much for being with us today to talk about vaccinations in the Latino community. Uh, Your organization recently released its Seizing the Moment report that looked at equitable distribution of the vaccine to Latino communities. Can you share a little bit about what you learned and what you're seeing related to COVID-19 in your community? Hi, Priya. Uh, Thanks again for having me part of this conversation. It's always great to connect with you. You know, as you know, Unidos U.S. is the largest civil rights and advocacy organization for Latinos um, in the country. And the Seizing the Moment report was instrumental for us to be able to really lift up kind of this whole sense of if you want to do this right, make sure you consider these following options, right? So since the beginning, you know, our affiliate network of, you know, almost nearly 300 community-based organizations and Unidos U.S. have been pretty much at the forefront, very similar to America's hospitals and to really address the pandemic. And so the fine, the, the season, uh, the moment report focused on five major recommendations to ensure an equitable response in, in front and center um, when working with communities of color, including Latinos living in the United States. So the first one is really the most essential one, is partner with trusted community-based leaders. I don't think that there's um, no other way to say this, but it's super important um, to be able to work with community-based organizations, leaders that have been with the community, fighting for the community, living in the community, and, and, and have that trust in the community. The next thing, I think, was also this whole essence of bringing vaccines to accessible, familiar areas. So, you know, I know that hospitals are in communities and across different areas, but oftentimes we forget about areas that, uh, you know, specific areas where, where many of our communities congregate, like flea markets or bodegas or, you know, uh, you know, different areas that oftentimes it might be a health system, but, you know, kind of these the day-to-day lives. And I think that's just as, as important. The third thing is making information about vaccines easily accessible. So while we're inundated with, you know, multiple information about COVID, you know, we're now almost two years in this. Ironically, many of our communities still lack information that is in language, meaning the language that they prefer to speak and or read. And that resonates for especially with our Spanish speaking community. Even to this date, there are many communities that still do not get the right information, the trusted information. And, you know, I think it's super important. One of the good things about this reporting, it highlights some state uh, examples, you know, Maryland being one of them where the home state where I live, where uh, the Latino community worked with very closely with the health department to establish a abuelita campaign. So this is a Spanish speaking grandmother talking about the importance of vaccines. And that resonated with a lot of community members here in Maryland. And one of the reasons I think that we have um, a very high vaccination rate, especially among the Latino community. So I can talk about the other two is around strengthening data collection and race ethnicity and reducing structural barriers, but I'm sure that we'll probably go into that a little bit deeper later on. Yeah, definitely. And so it's it's really interesting to hear 
those themes come through your report because they are similar themes that we've heard when we've spoken with different Asian communities, Black communities. You know, that partnership theme seems to be coming out in every conversation we have. It's so important. So what have been some of the key challenges to building confidence in the vaccine in the Latino community? And I, you touched on some, but are there others? I think the big thing for for many of the Latino communities, and, and you started seeing this during the summer the most, is when you reduce uh, structural barriers, then it becomes much more easier for people to be able to access vaccines and information and feel comfortable about the vaccines. And so you know, one of our recent bilingual Latino parents poll that we did with close to 1,400 Latino parents over the of children under the age of 18, they continue to to face systemic barriers in accessing vaccines. And from the examples that we had, so when we did this poll, it was in preparation of the five to 11 year olds, right, and and the emergency approval of of that vaccine. And we knew that there was some consistency across the board. When we dug a lot deeper, we saw that half of Latino parents with unvaccinated children under 18 are concerned that they may have to miss work to make a vaccine appointment or deal with the side effects of the vaccine and stay at home and not get paid and or co-pays and get co-pays or fees involved. To this day, I even get personal questions about even the boosters. They say, oh, well, is it covered? Do I, do I need to pay for it? Do I need to have, to have insurance for it? And oftentimes, not all the full information is there. So I think there's a lot for us to think about in terms of, you know, building confidence. We have made significant progress in this country for Latinos. Actually, we're one of the highest communities of color that have been, that have at least gotten one vaccine dose. And then about 23% in the, the latest data, we've seen that the last 14 days, you know, they've also gotten their one dose. So there's a lot to celebrate. But I think the biggest thing that continues to be a challenge for for Unidos US and our affiliate network and many of the community-based organizations out there working, and I can imagine also the hospitals, is this whole sense of misinformation. The misinformation, disinformation is one of the major challenges in building confidence in the vaccine among our communities, especially among the Spanish-speaking communities where information is less regulated. So in our last social media audit that we did, um, we're working with Upstreamers, one of our partners that does kind of like quarterly update, you know, kind of reviews what's going on in in the market, especially for Latinos. And we're starting to see that misinformation is turning into movement. You know, how they develop, exploiting fear, leading to resistance and creating much more misinformation or justification to their fears. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, Government resistance movements. So government mandates are unfair. You know, anti-vaccine leaflets targeting Latinos, you know, specifically in Sacramento per per se. Or it really plays into these fears of you're going to lose your job, it's going to affect your children. You know, a lot of activism around this area. So when we even talk about the messaging around mandates, it then turns into this other movement, right? religious resistance movements. So this whole thing of, you know, we, we were seeing this whole like the beast, you know, and the vaccine being that beast. So there's a lot there in terms of many of our pastors or faith leaders that may, and I'm not saying all of them do, but some of them do, you know, really lend to this whole religious resistance fear of movement. And then there's the traditional values, this whole sense of this natural immunity, you know, the the alternative medicines that will cure COVID um, and or be an alternate to the vaccine. A lot of these things, and especially with the social media resistance, is these unchecked information platforms, especially in Spanish, whether it's in the WhatsApp or in other um, elements. You're, you're starting to see this and it's becoming much more bigger and it's turned into a movement. And I think that's the biggest challenge for us is for us to really, really be focused on trying to ensure that whatever information that you get on the web, that you're checking your sources. Through our Esperanza Hope for All campaign, we're engaging with influencers to spread more accurate information. We've also launched a targeted uh, campaign for Latino millennials, stressing the importance of checking your sources before you like, before you share. And then we've got our Latino parents vaccine campaign, encouraging our parents to 
really take within the culture of protecting your kids as a way to protect, you know, get the vaccines to protect your kids, do your part in, in protecting your kids. So I think we're, you know, we continue to do this. Obviously, we don't have, you know, all the money in the world and all the, the, the advocates around it that, you know, that will stop some of these movements, but we're, we're doing our best to really make sure that we're training um, influencers, that we're working with our leaders and um, our community partners around um, misinformation and really tackling it. Yeah, and that is a huge challenge that misinformation and social media just sort of makes it so big of a challenge, right, as we move forward. And you you touched on a study that you did around vaccines for children and the campaign you just mentioned about keeping your kids safe. What is sort of the status of vaccinations for kids within your community? And what are some pieces of that campaign or other efforts you have to improve vaccination for kids? So the the Latino poll that we did um, with parents under the age of 18, we found that, you know, more than a year into the pandemic, Latino parents today feel more concerned than ever before about the impact that COVID has done on their family. So they're very supportive of actually policies that improve their family's health and their financial well-being. So that's the good news. The good news is that they believe that, you know, um, schools and administrators and, and our children should be vaccinated and there should be policies in place to be, protect them. And many of the parents felt like, you know, as soon as this is available, I'm going to go get my, my child vaccinated. So I think what the way our affiliates and our, our community-based organizations, including health centers, they have generations of experience in working with communities. So they continue to focus on this whole family-centered approach to sharing information, providing equitable access to the vaccines. We, we have seen significant progress in there. You know, this year alone within our campaign, our bigger campaign, the Esperanza Hope for All campaign, we've actually reached about 24 million individuals on COVID information. So this is bilingual. This is both in English and in Spanish through our social media, through our advertising, through our mobile tours, through our on the ground, what we call on the ground efforts. It's working with the communities, um, engaging with our promotoras de salud. We've trained about 50 trusted messengers, um, which are parents, their financial counselors, housing counselors within our network, and over about 200 promotoras de salud, which are community health workers to conduct, conduct outreach door to door, in group presentations, counter misinformation. We're also working with migrant Head Start programs, you know, that assist teachers on supporting children of migrant farm workers. And that has been largely around like our social and emotional well-being. We know that when we talk about COVID, we also need to talk about our mental health and our well-being as children and as families and as caregivers. And, you know, one of the recent reports that we joined with the COVID Collaborative was really to support um, children who've lost a caregiver. African-American and Latino children, there's 2.5 more likely to have lost a caregiver than a white, their white counterpart. So there's this call and a letter out to the American people to really support mental health services. And I think that's been super important for us. You know, I think there is still the, the yeah, unvaccinated Latino parents. So eight out of the 10 unvaccinated Latino parents report, you know, really serious and harmful side effects from COVID as one of their biggest concerns in getting their children vaccinated. I know because I personally know people that are parents that are you're still waiting and see how this might affect their children. And I think it's, it's you know, while it's good to have questions and, and be able to meet people where they're at, it's important that they also have the right information. And uh, for us to be able to listen, to learn about their concerns, um, but also to really, you know, have that sense of urgency about, you know, how long are we going to wait? You know, what information do you need to have now, especially with all these you know, different variants that are coming down the pipeline? And, and that's been an area of concern for, my, for myself and, and thinking about how can we really be more targeted in our approach? And I think that's kind of like the next phase of what we're thinking about. Yeah. And as you think through that, Rita, what, what's one thing you think the health system could do to help increase confidence in or access to the COVID vaccine in your community, especially for vaccinating kids? 
I think the the first and foremost, and and I'll always keep coming back to this, is making sure that you're partnering with community-based organizations. They're trusted in the community. There's strong community leaders. You know, the promotores de salud, you know, very similar to our healthcare workers in the hospital systems, seeing it firsthand. And joining forces together, I think, can really lead to much more powerful collaboration um, in really working, you know, in having much more broader access to free vaccines, boosters, strengthening the partnerships in the community. You know, I, I would say to health systems, hey, sponsor mobile to work which goes out to the communities, to those, you know, flea markets to share information and then also vaccinate individuals. You know, you can utilize the promotoras to be the educators and have the healthcare workers be the vaccine folks, right? I think that's super important, you know, to be able to very targeted in your approach and, and uh, being humble in, in, in that effort. I think it's just as important. Yeah, absolutely. And Rita, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about these important issues. And thank you always for your partnership as we work together to ensure the health of our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership and your advocacy as well.